welcome to this month's fiction and non-fiction yep. panel from the uh, Lions of Independent Authors. This month we're talking about building a sustainable business with multiple streams of income. Um, hopefully our names aren't lowest, but in case they're not, my name's Adam Scott and uh, this lady here is Hello, hello, hello Adam. So, um, we are talking this month about multiple streams of income. So I think we should probably start by explaining what we mean by that, and I'll hand over to you. Okay, so when you are still working for the man, um, you typically will have just one form of income, which is the salary that you get paid at the end of your working month. Um, now, multiple streams of income are more or less what they say on the tin in that you will have more than one source of income. And for a writer, they can be many, many and varied. But I think probably the biggest myth that um, goes around is thinking that having multiple formats uh, of your book, i.e. a paperback, an ebook, and an audiobook, is multiple streams of in income. And of course, those things are multiple streams of income, but they are, it's not enough uh, to secure yourself financially. I don't know if you want to add something to that. Just moving to another microphone. I'm being told that I can't be heard very well. So um, let's see if I can be heard any better over here. Um, it seems to be okay at my end, but apparently I'm much louder now because you just reacted yes. heavily. <laughs> really, so, um, really loud. I'm, I'm assuming I can now be heard by everybody. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, we were talking about multiple streams of income and um, I think we touched on the fact that you're talking about other people and jobs that people have and the fact that you know you're relying on one person for your income but a lot of people do have side gigs or they have part-time jobs they have investment portfolios things like that and it, it, this is not something that's just peculiar to writers is it no no absolutely not and i think there's also two different types of income that we should be talking about here. The first one is what I like to call active income and the second one is called passive income. And just to explain those two briefly, active income is anything where you have to expend your time in order to earn the money for that. So for example, um, being a consultant or um, being a doctor or you know, being a project manager for a company, you are exchanging your time and actively, uh, you know, using your time in order to earn the money for that. Passive income, therefore, is when you, you know, inevitably you will have to spend some time like creating a book. But once you've created that book, you will earn from it repeatedly over and over again, passively generating income for the lifetime, for your lifetime and many, many years afterwards. And other examples include things like uh, rent from uh, investment properties, uh, investing in stocks and shares. Um, yes, uh, you know, earning from courses or other things that you have sold. So I just thought it was important to touch on those two types of income as well. So for writers who would say, well, I wanted to become a writer because I wanted to just write books and I wanted to do that all day. I'm not interested in doing uh, other things to earn money as well. What would you say to those writers? Um, that I hear this a lot and I get it. I do. Believe me, all of us want to write all day and live the dream. And there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Let me just um, say that from the start. But not having multiple streams of income because you just want to earn royalties is really dangerous for you financially and for your financial security. So I'll give you an example. I used to um, work for local government as a project manager and I lived in a property that was owned by my employer. And in the last two years of my employment, I was under risk of redundancy four times. So I not only would have lost my house, I would have lost my income as well. So when you only want your income to come from one source, i.e. your book royalties, you are putting yourself in financial jeopardy. Now, 
That's not to say you have to have income sources that um, take up your time. We've already spoken about passive income sources and you can create lots and lots and lots of these passive income sources so that you can free up your time to write all day if that's what you want to do. Um, so, so yes, that is, that is what I would say. This is about creating financial security for the long term, um, which ultimately will get you that dream of writing all day. Yeah, I think the key here is this is a very up and down industry. Um, as most authors will know, when you release a book, there's a bit of a spike and it goes through massive peaks and troughs, which is um, not something which is ideal, really, if it's your main income source. So having those other things, I think, can probably stabilize your income as well as providing that that extra security. Um, when it comes to security, I think that is, as you say, the main thing. And I think this kind of... Um, it's a similar argument to why I'm in favour of authors being wide and why allies yeah. in favour of authors being wide, not relying on, on one source of income for everything. So I think it's um, it's much the same argument that we have, um, and the same persuasion, uh, same persuasion that we try to put forward, that uh, everything should be about the long term rather than just looking um, at one source of income. Um, and as well, I suppose, security, if you get ill. Mm. If you're unable to write for a period of time, which I experienced last year, I you know didn't get anything done for about five or six months because I, I was very unwell. And having those other things, I've got courses, um, I do some some private coaching, I've got um, affiliated products, things like that, um, meant that I was able to take that that time out to uh, to recover. So I think there's, there's there are lots of very persuasive arguments for that. Um, now we are the fiction and non-fiction. Sorry, go on. You're well. I was just going to say that there there is an argument um, to be had around like insurance there as well. Like I don't I don't remember the sort of accountancy term, but you know, like an income type protection business type insurance, just in case you know you break your hand or whatever and you can't um, work. And that is again then another layer of protection for yourself financially should yeah. the worst happen. And all of us do that when we buy houses anyway. You know, we all get the life insurances mm -hmm. to protect our mortgages and. Stuff. Stuff. So it would make sense, I think, you know, for your business to have that layer of protection as well. Yeah, good shout, good shout. Um, we're going to move on to the um, non-fiction and fiction side of things. We are the fiction and non-fiction salons. So we probably should um, diverge at this point and talk about the two aspects there. Um, but I did just want to say for anybody who is watching um, live on Facebook, if you want to leave a comment um, below, if you've got any questions, then we can get back to you on that. Um, so that the methods and the means of multiple income streams do differ between fiction and non-fiction don't they um i think i will probably um take the fiction side of things and i'll allow you with your um all of your non-fiction stuff and your your rebel author um <laughs> jumper i can see that you're wearing there i'll let you take the uh, the non-fiction side of things first yeah okay so i mean all you have to do is use your imagination here i mean we are we are creative as easier said than done. I know, me. I know. Well, well. <laughs> um, so I'm going. Well, I'm going to run through lots of different ways uh, in which you can generate multiple streams of income. Um, but I suppose the biggest thing is when you have a nonfiction book, is to not see it as just a book. Um, both of my nonfiction books, for those watching, can see behind me. Or for those listening, I have um, you know more than one nonfiction book. I turn all of them into workbooks as well, and so I repurpose some of the content there into a um you know summaries uh, to give some explanations and then we have questions you know exercises uh in the in the rest of the book um so that's one thing you can do um adam has already mentioned coaching um not everybody is suited to coaching and i think that's a really important point don't feel pressured you know to coach other authors we are not we don't all have those personalities when we can do that um but that obviously is one way of um, generating income. Um, courses as well. If you have a nonfiction book on a particular topic, then you can uh, create, be it mini courses, big courses, uh, online self-learning at the moment is extremely popular. So you can convert your um, books to courses. And it's important to say, you have to add a little bit more. So each, um, each product is 
you know, a product in isolation by itself, but you also need to add a little bit something extra um, for your courses so that people don't feel you're just rehashing the same content. That's not to say it needs to be wildly difficult, but just more. Um, you can also speak on those topics. So that is an active form of income, but where you um, create a nonfiction book, you become an authority on that topic and you can then get speaking gigs. Um, you can also do things like podcasting. Um, and although podcasting doesn't necessarily immediately generate an income, there are opportunities once you have uh, lots of downloads um, and lots of listeners for things like sponsorship, um, affiliation, uh, and also also, um, you, can, you can possibly have Patreon as well, where you can get your supporters to help pay for things like um, hosting, um, you know, logos or, or whatever. Um, lots, sorry, lots of these things feed into each other as well, don't they? So, for example, if you're podcasting or if you're vlogging, um, that might not immediately earn you um, an income. It might do if you're lucky enough to get sponsorship but it can lead to speaking opportunities. It can increase book sales. It can uh, increase course sales. I know with my Indie Author Mindset podcast, I quite often mention my courses on there and I know that a number of sales come through that. So that kind of um, inadvertently um, pulls in other forms of income as well. So I think it's a lot of these things are interconnected too, aren't they? Absolutely. They are all serving to grow and increase your platform. Um, you know, and it only takes one listener to say, oh, I loved this podcast to to another writer friend. And all of a sudden, you know, they've told somebody else and you have another, you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 listeners. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Once you um, also have things like a podcast or a very distinctive brand, you can then also create merchandise. So uh, for those watching, they, they can see that I'm wearing um, my <laughs> Rebel Author podcast hoodie and for those listening um i have a podcast called the rebel author where i have also developed a merchandising uh, line of products so i have notebooks and mugs and um laptop cases and t-shirts and hoodies uh with different rebellious uh phrases and uh, there's some other villainous things that are in the works so um you can then promote those that is a line of an extra line of income as well um, I like the way we both managed to plug our own podcasts in yeah. there as well. That was, uh, that, that was quite smartly done. Hey, um, it's all relevant this time. It's all relevant. Well, yes. Um, we had a, a comment here from uh, Regina Joyce Clark. He says, hello from upstate New York, and said, um, time is a factor. If all writers created a podcast, there'd be a lot for folks to choose from. Um, and she asked about making podcasts stand out. And I think the key there is standing out. If you can, and if you have um, a unique voice or a unique take on things, um, then I think that's fair enough. But again, all of these suggestions we're making are not necessarily for everybody. No, and the thing to add here is you could say the same about books. I mean, there are how many millions of books on, on Amazon? And yet we still we still write books. And the thing is, you have to find the thing that is uniquely you and then do that over and over again really, really well. And you will find your audience and serve that niche. This is not about creating, you know, a podcast necessarily for everybody. My podcast is really sweary, it's rebellious, it's naughty and cheeky and sarcastic. That's not going to be for everybody, and I'm okay with that. And so this is about embracing who you are and and you know developing that into your nonfiction brand. Mm. And likewise, the Indie Author Mindset podcast is a swearing free zone. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm going to move on to fiction now. Yeah. Um, and I think the main thing here, um, I mean, you said, um, I wrote, wrote it down as you said it there about nonfiction. You're saying it's not just a book. And I think that's that's similar as well for, for fiction. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's where we then start to diverge, because mainly for fiction, we're looking at, I suppose, primarily different formats. We think about doing ebooks and doing a paperback sometimes doing an audio book as well. But there is a big market for hardback um, readers and hardback books, um, large print as well, particularly once you get um, into looking at libraries. A lot of libraries now, particularly in the UK, where they're very cash strapped, are ordering um, only large print books because a lot of library users perhaps are older. Um, they are um, maybe they have a, a sight related disability, which means that they, they get their books from the library rather than elsewhere. Um, and of course, a large print book can be read by anybody. Yeah. You don't have to um, be short-sighted or, or anything like that. Um, whereas a, a normal print book excludes a lot of people. So a lot of libraries, in order to try and um, 
deliver better cost savings, I guess, that for their local councils are ordering um, large print books in. So that's that's something you should really kind of um, bear in mind, I think, um, as well. Things like having an agent or some form of representation for uh, film, TV, radio adaptations. That's key. Um, it's very, very difficult to to get that done. But you've got nothing to lose. The agent's not going to cost you anything. They'll they'll take um, a cut if they manage to get one of your books turned into a movie. And I'm fine with that. If I want to take a bit of that, it's, um, that'd be nice enough my nose if it comes to that point. Um, translations as well. This is something you can um you can handle yourself if you want to, or you can um, sub-license those rights again through agents and things like this. Um, and even little things like recently, I've seen quite a few uh, books have been turned into story based apps and interactive games and things like this. I mean, you know, we're all this is not something that all authors uh, will want to do, but it's a case of putting those ideas out there, saying these things are possible. These are options and seeing um what works for you um we had a comment on facebook from um mg vasiago I, I think is how it's pronounced saying thinking of multiple streams of income is very overwhelming when you're trying to do it all on your own and again that is the, the point i'm trying to make there these are not necessarily things that everybody um will want to do you know sasha and i we don't do all of these. We have a couple. You know, personally, I um, I don't like going out and doing talks and appearances and things like that. I quite often do them online, um, but it would mean leaving the house. Otherwise, I'm, ne I'm never keen on that. Um, so I focus on things like private coaching, on courses and on my podcast. Um, again, these aren't things that I have started doing overnight. These are introduced over the course of the last 10 years that I've been doing this. So, yeah, it, it, it does. Um, I have pronounced the name right, apparently, as well. I'll just uh, give myself some brownie points there. Well done. Clap on the back there. So, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's something that is quite easy for anybody to set up, authors of all levels, um, and which does apply to fiction and nonfiction, but I admit is something I do not understand, but I know you do, is... Patreon or Patreon. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. So I'm I think it depends. You know this. Oh, yeah, I think it depends which side of the pond you're on. So I say Patreon, but I think um, in America they say Patreon. Uh, right. Don't so Patreon is the right way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't be so British. <laughs> <laughs> so if you um, explain that for yeah. us, then how that works, especially I guess for fiction authors and non-fiction authors. Yeah, so Patreon is a platform where uh, supporters, fans, readers, listeners can subscribe essentially to you and your creations. So they can spend, say, a dollar a month, two dollars a month. You can decide on the tiers. So I have a, I think it's two dollar, five dollar, and ten dollar tiers um, and you pay that each month and you will get different rewards um, depending on um, which tier you're in. So um, it I and I will try and go through fiction and non-fiction ideas for everybody. Um, <clears throat> But essentially, you are paying because you want to get more from whoever it is that you're supporting. So let's say, you know, I wanted to support Lauren Oliver, who's one of my favorite young adult authors. I would pay my two dollars and she might give me an extra short story every month. This is if she's a fiction writer. So she, I might get another short story. Um, I might get a live Q&A with her. Um, uh, she might do um, an extra funny video or she might do a behind the scenes of how she came up with the ideas of, for a book and um, how she came up with, um, I don't know, the, where the inspiration came from. Um, she might write an essay based on the themes in her uh, fiction book, for example. Or if you were Adam Croft, you could, uh, you know, write about the, a true crime thing that inspired one of your uh, crime novels, for example. On the nonfiction side, um, so my patron is more nonfiction um, and it is uh, connected to my podcast. So everybody who is a 
subscriber will get early access to every single episode of the Rebel Author Podcast. That I then do bonus things. So I sent uh, Rebel Author stickers at Christmas and they get things like um, Q&As, extra audio. They will um, get a box each month where I say, what content would you like me to talk about this month? And then I will go and talk about that content and give them tips and tricks and, you know, really personalize um, the content that I am giving them. So, yeah, hopefully that gives an overview of Patreon. Yes. And I guess the thing that, that strikes me is, that, again, this is something that does require additional effort. I mean, when you said about, you know, paying two pounds a month and getting a free short story every month, my, my heart just jumped at the thought of having to write another short story every month. <laughs> um, but again, if you are getting the money for this, you are being paid for your writing. It's, it's just another way of, of organising that, I suppose, and having that money coming in, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, and you don't have to do a short story. I mean, it's just I was throwing ideas yeah, out there, course, you know. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, what we are going to touch on briefly as well, um, because Emma Larkin um, asked about merchandise. Um, which okay. you mentioned you've got your your Rebel Author um, hoodie on there. Um, how can merchandise be sourced and how is that set up? Is it something that's really difficult to do? No, it's not. So it used to be, but now it's not. So uh, the, pay, the I use Redbubble, uh, which is a, an online shop, essentially. And it's very much like using Ingram Spark in terms of it's a print on demand service. So I have paid a designer to design the logo, the image, the you know funky writing, whatever it is that I want to go on my products. And I've made sure that I've paid, you know, to have the exclusive reproduction rights of you know, using that. It's very important that you tell the designer this is going on merchandise that will be sold repeatedly so that you are paying for, you know, the copyright um, of that piece of work. Um, and then you upload your design. Um, it Like Ingram Spark, depending on the book and the size and the trim size, you have to make sure you're uploading the image in its correct sizing and dimensions. And all of that information is always on the websites. Um, and then you literally say, you know, I want it on an iPhone cover, I want it on a notebook, I want it on a jumper. And then just like Amazon, somebody you'll hit go live and it will somebody will go to the website or use your link and then they'll click I would like a hoodie and they pay and it gets printed and shipped to that person. Um, some other sites are Teespring, Society6, um, and I'm probably so, out there. So basically, it's a lot easier than it sounds, or a lot yes. easier than made it sound. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I think it's a case of looking at what your um, particular skills are. Um, and you know, if you've got any uh, background, I suppose, in 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 your your main day job or your previous career, or any particular interests, any particular skills you have. So, for example, the reason I do the podcast and the reason I do these salons and things like this um, is because I've got a bit of a radio background and broadcast background, and I genuinely enjoy doing it. So, I guess you not, kind of use not the... your dulcet tones, then. No, and my dulcet <laughs> tones, of course. You, um, <laughs> Mary, has asked for the names of those sites as well that you mentioned. By the way, there, Sasha. So we'll pop those um, in the Facebook thread afterwards for you there, Mary. So you've got some links. Um, so, for example, if you have if you're a fiction writer, you have um, books that are based around a certain location, they're very location heavy. You could um, run some some walking tours, for example, around locations there and offer your your insight that you've gained through researching those books if you're a historical novelist you might want to do talks on on romans or tudors and and sort of in in introduce and inject some of those stories that that you've created um yeah, there are lots of different things you could could do and that would also potentially help you sell a few books at these events and talks and things as well so um yeah i think it's it's a case of looking at what your particular skills and interests and backgrounds are I think, isn't it? It is, absolutely. And, th you know, just because you leave a day job doesn't mean that you have to stop using those skills. So let's say you're an event planner, perhaps you could, you know, run events for authors. Or if you were a baker, you could bake book cakes with, you know, the covers on for launches or what, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, just because we are, you know, saying goodbye to the rat race doesn't mean um, that you have to stop using those skills. And 
Yeah, so absolutely. There's a few um, requests for the merchandise site. So we will, just to reiterate, we will put all of those in the show notes and um, in the comments as well on the Facebook Live section. We will, yes. Um, so I think we've um, more or less covered most of the things that we uh, were going to do uh, we'll hang around for another couple of minutes just in case we do get some some more questions or comments here on the facebook thread um but i think we should probably try and distill things down at the end of the show so a nice summary um do you what would you say sasha is your biggest tip for authors wanting to diversify their income and introduce new income streams um probably twofold um, the first one is um, to basically not view this as a negative. So this is all about mindset and viewing multiple streams of income as a way to protect yourself financially, not a way to drain your time and stop you from being able to write. This is literally about protecting you, your business, your time and your family um, to give you enough income you know, passively so that you can choose to write all day if that's what you want. Um, and and so along with the mindset is trying to think outside the box, being creative with um, the uh, you know forms and streams of income. And then lastly, I think, don't forget the skills that you've already developed in your life. You know, we, we have lovely long careers now and um, there is nothing to stop you utilizing those skills that you've already developed in your careers to generate different forms of income yeah excellent excellent stuff excellent tips um i think mine would be to um at a very basic level even just think about formats um you know one book is not just one product so you can have a paperback a hardback an ebook an audio book you can look at box sets and all, all of these things have different audiences and you can open up wider um income streams just from something that you've already created you're just reformatting it this is something which is has been done for, for years and years you know, look at agents for translations and for film and tv rights um and you know have people out there doing those things for you it's not going to cost you anything you have to pay them a certain percentage if you get these deals um but it, you know you've really got nothing to lose by looking at those things one piece of work can be used many different times for different formats and different audiences i think that would probably be my biggest takeaway um mc Vas vasiago hope I've got that right again. I can't remember what I said the first time, but I got it right the first time. So I hope I've said it the same way. Um, asks to diversify into different income streams. Um, do you need to set yourself up as a business? And I'm pretty sure, Sasha, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun here, but I think you would probably agree with me that um, it's always a good idea anyway for authors to set themselves up as a business. Whether that is legally as a business entity is a, is a question for you know, between you and your accountant, really. But I think in terms of professionalism and treating it like a business, that really is the whole point of being an author in, in 2020 and beyond, is that you need to treat it as a business. You need to, to be professional um, in that sense. Um, I'm fairly sure you'd probably agree with me there. I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, I you know, there are many, many different legal forms, um, whether you're a sole trader, limited company, you know, I think it's LLC in America. So uh, but that is a question for definitely an accountant. Suffice yeah. to say, as if you're speaking to accountant, you're probably treating yourself like your business, which is a good thing. Yes, yes. And um, we have had a question as well. <laughs> Again, putting you really on the spot here. Yeah, um, I'm I guess not answering that. To... You probably don't want to go for that one. No, that's fine. I um, I tend not to share my um, financial information directly as well. Um, I'm willing to say it's in the six figures, but um, that, that's all I'm going, I'm going for there. Um, so I um, have very much enjoyed this month's session. I think next month um, we... Are we doing a next month one? We have a London Book Fair, don't we? I think it's. Uh, I think yeah, we right. are. But I am. Um, I'm not sure if Orna. I'm not sure. We're not sure who's going to replace me. But I am not able to join the next one. But um, next there one. will be somebody in my place, and then I'll be back in April. Yes, well, we're going to be talking about formatting and design in the next one. How you can make your book look as good as possible, inside out, uh, inside and out probably not inside out um anyway thank you very much sasha that's been um very very insightful very very helpful and um hopefully um the the good people listening and watching have had some um some good information some good content there oh, thank you very much um i'm gonna let you stop the session because i don't oh, know yes. how <laughs> <laughs>
And yeah. um, hopefully we will um, we'll be back here um, in March. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.